Well, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome. Well, as today's program is held in conjunction with the exhibition Ever Present, I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. We respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country where each First Nation artist resides or where the art in Ever Present was created. We recognize their continuing connections to country, community, and culture, and pay respect to their elders, leaders, and artists, past and present. We respectfully acknowledge all First Nations traditional custodians whose art we are currently exhibiting in Singapore. Well, this afternoon, uh, it's a privilege for me to introduce Richard Bell. Richard was born in 1953 in Charleville, Queensland. Uh, Richard is a Brisbane-based artist and a member of the Camille Laroy, Kuma, Jimam, and Gurang Gurang communities. Richard grew out of a generation of Aboriginal activists and has remained committed to the politics of Aboriginal emancipation and self-determination. He's one of Australia's most significant contemporary artists who works across painting, video art, installation, text, and performance. His work explores complex artistic and political problems of colonial effects and Aboriginal art production. He was awarded the Telstra National Aboriginal Art Awards in 2003, and his work is held in the collection of the National Gallery of Australia, all state galleries in Australia, as well as the Tate in London. Well, welcome, Richard, and thank you for coming to speak with us today. Well, before we begin our conversation, I would also like to share a bit about the Aboriginal Ten Embassy, which has been a part of Canberra's physical and political landscape. And in today's context, the inspiration behind Richard Bell's embassy, the work we're currently sitting in. Well, the Ab Aboriginal Ten Embassy was set up in 1972 by Michael Anderson, Billy Craigie, Bertie Williams, and Tony Cooney, Curry, in response to Prime Minister William McMahon's statement, rejecting Aboriginal right land rights on Australia Day. In activist and historian Gary Foley's recollection, the Aboriginal Embassy was established because the McMahon's govern government, quote, makes us aliens in our own land. And so like other aliens, we need an embassy. It has existed intermittently on the lawns of the old parliament house since 1972 and permanently since 1992. This year is the 50th anniversary of the original tent embassy. It stands as a reminder of the fierce resilience of first peoples in their fight for recognition and change in Australia. While Richard's embassy was first exhibited in Melbourne in 2013, since the work has travelled extensively in Australia to Perth, Cannes, Sydney, Brisbane, as well as to Moscow, Jerusalem, Jakarta, New York, Venice, and Amsterdam. Most recently, concurrently with Ever Present, embassies also presented at Documenta 15 in Castle, Germany. And you can see some images of those presentations here on the screen. Throughout the duration of the Ever Present Exhibition, Embassy is a venue for a series of programs developed by curatorial and curatorial programs teams in consultation with Richard. It also hosts two films that play on a loop, Ningla Anna, a 1972 documentary by Alessandro Cavadini on the original Ten Embassy, and Broken English, a video work by Richard in conversation with Gary Foley. These programs and discussions animate the history behind Embassy. They remind us of the past struggles and the work left to be done. By locating embassy in the city hall chamber, a space built during the period of Singapore's colonial history, it hopefully adds resonance to the artwork by drawing out the parallel legacies of British colonial, colonial history between Australia and Singapore. Through its activation, embassy reconnects this exhibition to issues of general concern that are meaningful for the contemporary Singapore audience. The National Gallery Singapore is committed to presenting exhibitions that are relevant and engaged. And the presentation of Embassy is a very important demonstration to this commitment. If you've ever visited the exhibition Ever Present, um, you might also have encountered another work by Richard, Omega Bell's Theorem from 2013. The painting is located in the exhibition's final section, Resistance and Colonization. which presents art that highlights the social and political injustices of colonization and government policies of forced integration, assimilation, and removal. Well, Richard, um, maybe we could, in 
beginning our conversation. In an artist's statement, you wrote of the Aboriginal Ten Embassy as a symbol of resistance, while simultaneously an aberration that upsets the master servant paradigm. You were 19 when the Aboriginal Ten Embassy protest took place. I wanted to start by asking you to share a bit more about what you remember of that period. How have the events come to influence you as a young adult and as an artist today? Um, Jim, I'm trying to think of how old I was when <laughs> 72, I would have been. According yeah. to our research, you're. Am I going? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Anyway, I was having a good time. <laughs> um, but I was still, uh, I was still uh, at that stage, um, 1972, that was, that was my last year of, of high school. Um, um, and um, I, well, I was poor. I, I, I couldn't make it down to Canberra you know, for, for this protest. You know, um, but there was, there was plenty of coverage of it. You know, like... Um, it was uh, on the news, you know, kind of every day, <laughs> um, and where, um, well, we'd been like I, I remember myself. My my personal experience was to I was um, I was uh, spent the first two years of my life living in a tent uh, before you know the white people. In the town threw away enough corrugated iron for us to build a tin shack, you know, um, for us to live in that. Um, that's what we lived in until I, I moved to um, Tina's country. Um, uh, went to, to Darwin. My mother got a job up there working in a home for half caste Aboriginal children. Um, well, I read that um, in the 80s when you were still in Brisbane, you were, I'm going to quote, um, Painting and selling pretty pictures to tourists, that's how you described it. Yeah. How did this change to your current practice come about? Oh, it was an accident. Um, I, I, was, um, I was making tourist art. You know, like, uh, I was trying to make uh, money out of um, you know, um, making you know, uh, Aboriginal arts and crafts, you know, like making boomerangs and spears and that sort of thing. But... Um, yeah, we had fierce competition you know, from the Chinese and the Indonesians. You know, like, uh, Even at that time. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, they, they put a stop to our, our um, boomerang making. Um, and I had to find ways, different ways of, of um, uh, earning money. You know, like, um, and basically, uh, uh, paintings, you know, they were quick. You know, like we, we could paint really fast. You know, cause, uh, uh, we had to paint like 200 boomerangs a day just to make like a hundred dollars for a day. So it might take us you know, like 12 hours to do to do that. So, but then somebody when I graduated to making these little pictures, this white guy said to me one day, he said, "Why don't you get into fine art? I said, Look at these fine lines here." <laughs> And he said, no, I mean, sort of high art. I said, oh, why the fuck would I do that? You know, like, uh, you know, uh, he said, well, now you're an activist. You're like, um, you can get away with stuff in art that you, you, know, um, you can say and do stuff in art um, that um, you know, will get you arrested uh, you know, outside an art gallery. So, so was that how this activistic dimension in your art came about then? Um, well, you know, look, I, I found out that you, know, you can make uh, paintings you know, like, uh, about protests, you know, about, you know, and make protests in those paintings. Uh, well, it was um, the best offer I'd, I'd ever had in my life, I think. You know, you know, the, the ability to make art, say th and do things and not get arrested. You know, it, was, it was great. And what about the tent, the embassy itself? How did the, the initial conception of the work come about? Oh, well, um, not long after, I think in 1974, I moved to, to Sydney. Um, um, I, well, I didn't move to Sydney, I just arrived there. I was on my way back to, to Brisbane from fruit picking down south. But I landed in, in Redfern and um, ended up meeting 
this guy on on the platform at uh, Central Station, and um, he took me up to Redfern, got me a place to stay. Um, then they got me a job and and all these sorts of things. And um, what, what what kind of job were you working? Oh, in that time? Gee, well, well um, machinists in uh, like a. I'd spent a couple of years um, as um, um, an apprentice um, tool maker, so I had I had some skills that I I could I could use. Um, so I, I was, and there were lots of jobs then. I, I think I've had more than a hundred jobs in my life. You know, so, uh, so I never thought much of any of them, you know, except the, the one that I, I worked for my community. You know. And I, that's how I got into the activism. So, uh, just hanging around um, the, the, the activists. Um, they had the most con you know, interesting conversations and so I'd go to their place or go to the pub and you know, we'd get there and be talking about um, black power. You know, so, you know, you know, having come from you know, abject poverty you know, like in Western... Queensland in the outback of Australia, you know, um, uh, to be talking with these people, you know, like in this most empowered way, you know, like um, really, you know, um, I needed that, you know, like um, um, the life in in the bush is soul crushing, you know. So it was it was great for me to get out of that set of circumstances and in this. You know, area of positivity. Why, well, in 1997, you also co-founded Proper Now, which is a Queensland collective of urban Aboriginal artists, including artists such as Vernon Archie, which is also in the exhibition. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how that began too? Um, I think you're talking about a campfire group? Proper Now. Proper Now, we, we started in 2004. Ah, okay. Yeah. Right. Sorry, my mistake. Yeah. Um, but um, we, my, my brother uh, and this white guy started campfire group and then I joined in with, with that. And we did a lot of stuff around um, around Brisbane. I think it lasted about 20 years, you know, ran this course and that. Um, um, but we, through that we learned about... Um, um, Western art. We learned about the contemporary art scene. You know, like, um, like we'd all learnt um, how to make tourist art and that sort of thing. So we there was basic, that was basically our college. You know, like um, our art college was um, was um, campfire group. So it was a collective uh, yeah. learning. Yeah. Well, that, it was um, a group that you know, white people were, were part of as well. You know, they. They worked and showed with us, you know, like, um, you know, as long as they bought us beer and gave us food and, you know, some pot every now and then, you know, like, we'd, we'd let them come and show with us, you know, so. <laughs> it was a fair deal. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> so, as you know, um, Embassy, as I mentioned before, uh, Embassy has been shown all around the world. And um, it's also foregrounded issues of concerns to ind indigenous people around the world today. And it's been presented in many countries, including right now, in, right now in Castle. Can you share a bit about how different or similar some of these discussions that have emerged in different iterations of embassy outside of Australia from those uh, inside Australia? Well, the conversations are different you know, with every single person. You know, like, um, uh, of course, you know, the circumstances uh, have changed. You know, like, um, you know, um, there's been many occasions where we've had uh, indigenous people, you know, like um, including in New York, I had uh, the great fortune to have um, um, Sylvia McAdam, who co-founded Idle No More. Um, she she came to New York City. Um, she sp she spoke there. She was uh, she's fantastic. Um, the young women who started. Um, the uh, all over Black Lives Matter movement. Um, uh, they came attended, I think, in, in New York City. Um, well, uh, Emery Douglas from the Black Panther Party and members of the, the local chapter, the New York chapter of the Black Panther Party, 
for us at, at that um, embassy. Um, I've, I've been around Australia, like um, with Indigenous peoples from all around. It's it's um, a symbol of, of Aboriginal sovereignty. You know, um, we weren't allowed to talk about sovereignty. You know, um, uh, that was not on the table when um, the embassy was was first established. So, you know, to to assert to the Australian government that you know, like, uh, we have an embassy you know, like, um, was an assertion of, of sovereignty. Um, so we put it on the table without them knowing sort of thing. Well, since then, there have been a few kind of landmark events, um, including the, the Mabo case in the yeah. 90s, and more recently, the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, do you think the um, position of Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islander people okay. in Australia have changed? Right. In 1982, I was working for the Aboriginal Legal Service in the New South Wales Aboriginal Legal Service in Redfern. Um, um, we'd already had two cases go before the the High Court of Australia, you know, about Aboriginal land rights in Australia. Uh, first was Malirupan versus Nabalco in in the Northern Territory, um, and the second was Co versus the Commonwealth, um, and they both failed, um, but. Um, uh, we knew that we had to go forward to to, to reach the, this final barrier. You know, like, um, and um, I said to Co one day, Co, I can get this. I can get the money for for this meeting. He gave me the go ahead to to set up this meeting of all the Aboriginal legal services around the country. You know, like, and we were all uh, we all met. In Redfern. You know, what like, year um, was this again? 1982. Okay. Um, and um, I arranged that meeting. You know, like, uh, well, I told people what to do. I did do a bit like you, what you do. You know, like, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and they uh, and, and together we put together the, the, this meeting. And at that meeting, we chose Marbo as the case to go forward. And what we were looking for was was Aboriginal land rights. And then ten years later, you know, like. Um, uh, the decision came down that um, we, we'd got native title. You're like, you know, what? You're like, <laughs> what's <laughs> what's native title? You're like, <laughs> um, I think it exists in some minor way in in you know in the United States. Uh, but um, we were fighting for land rights, and, and I, I was from my side of the politics, the, the political fence in in Aboriginal life in Australia. We were very disappointed that that um, we didn't get land rights, and that what we got was uh, native title, which is something much less. Can if you explain if, the difference. The, the difference, okay. Um, um, Aboriginal land rights is, is um, uh, gives us inalienable uh, title to to our land, um, uh, and it, it's a much stronger form of, of land title. Than, than native title. Native title is the weakest title in uh, in the in Australia, so it's weaker than a lease, you know, we, um, um, and weaker than Aboriginal land rights. Um, so we were very disappointed with with uh, with that, um, and, the, uh, and the fact that um, it created this huge you know, bureaucracy, you know, like and. We have this farcical situation now where we have to, the, the the people who who tell us that we're Aboriginal are anthropologists. Yeah. So you know, like um, I I cannot declare myself to be an Aboriginal under Native Title, you know, um, without the um, backing of some goddamn anthropologist. So you know. Like, uh, I can prove I'm Aboriginal in 30 seconds, you know, talking to other Aboriginal people. You know, that's our passport. Our passport is, you know, our, our family, our story, you know, our, our country. You know, like, uh, 
So you know, can, and basically all of us can can do that. If if I'm talking to somebody from over the other side of the country, it might take two or three minutes. You know, like, but then we'll find you know, um, the the common denominators, and then we'll be able to talk. We'll be able to have discussions about the world. Yeah, you were sharing the story about the the Mabo case. Oh, so. yeah. Well, um, with the Mar with the Mabo case, you're like. Um, uh, the reason we chose Marbo was uh, because there was no, nobody to oppose it. it if we had a, a case on the mainland and one of the neighbours you know, um, opposed it, the whole case would fall down. Marbo was an island. Mar Mar Marbo, yeah, yeah. You know, the Marbo case was based on an island called Mer, which is just off um, the coast of Australia. So... Um, but have, having gotten to that far, though, you know, like, um, um, I think we've gone backwards um, with native title um, simply because um, um, it, of the divisions that, that have been created you know, through um, uh, native title. You know, um, there's competing in, interests and, and this sort of thing. You know, like, um, we're, we're arguing with our neighbours who we've been getting on with for thousands of years and now we're arguing with them. You know, so um, you know, I, I just think it's, it's um, a really destructive um, thing and we should, we should just disavow it and move on and go back to fighting for land rights again. And as I mentioned, in 2017, there was the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which uh, the Albanese government endorsed as the first act uh, coming to power. 2017? No, it was, it was last year or something, wasn't it? It was first drafted in 2017. 2017? But it was endorsed this year by the Albanese government when they took power. Didn't it? Was, was that, was that 2017? Wow. Jeez. Oh, is that when they, when they went out to Uluru? Is that when they had that um, had that blank canvas? That's where they where they they've got the, the statement written on the blank canvas at the meeting where they actually supposedly endorsed this, came up with this statement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The statement is supposed to be from this meeting in, in, at, at Uluru. But clearly, the, the representatives from all the different Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander yeah, communities. Yeah, well, there, well the, the, there was a conflict there that that is is not reported or underreported, and, and that that incident was that the young people um, from the east coast were asked to leave. Uh, uh, they were told that they uh, didn't have a place there, and um, uh, most of the older people. Um, most of the elders from the East Coast um, walked out in sympathy with them. So there, there, is, there is no unanimity you know, uh, with, the, with this thing. Right, this right. statement was written several years before then. I see, I see. came from, you know, from that meeting and it did not because, you know, like, uh, there's, there's a video on their own website where you, show, you see this, this blank canvas with the statement already there. And then the artists come along and paint it after. And then they present that as, as, as proof of this thing being, you know, from the heart, from... But nevertheless, the endorsement by the, the government, that, that's... A yeah, of course they're going to endorse it. You know, look at that. There's, there's no responsibility in, in there for the government whatsoever. You know, like, all they get is a bunch of black fellas sitting over to the side, you know, like, uh, and, and they, they can tell them, yeah, oh, this is what, what we feel. And they can just overrule it. You know, they can, they can just take no notice of it whatsoever. You know, it's, it's just absolutely pointless. All it does is gives them people, you know, a, a really high-paying job. You know, and then they'll, they'll, be, they'll all have staff, and there'll be more high-paying jobs for their friends and that sort of thing. We've seen this movie before. You know, like um, there, was, there was reconciliation, there was recognised, and now we got statement from the heart. It's all the same. It's, it's just smoke and mirrors. <laughs> there's, there's no land involved in this thing. There's, there's no compensation or reparations. You know, like whatever you want to call it. There's no, there's no land, no money, no power sharing. Come on. Uh, 
It, 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 this thing makes the white people feel so happy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they can feel like they're they're doing something. They feel like they're oh geez, they're helping the Aborigines, the poor Aborigines. Yeah. Yeah. They stole a whole continent, right? Brutally. Yeah. They gotta face up to this. they've got to have a truth and reconciliation process there, you know, before they start, you know. Anything else. Right, right. Okay, before we open up, um, uh, Richard's very keen to hear from, from the audience. And but before we open up to that, I'd like to ask you, as I mentioned, uh, embassy is being shown at Documenta. And in 2002, you wrote uh, your essay, Bell's Theorem, which highlights the uh, long-standing in inequities in the Aboriginal art market, especially the role played by the art centers as mediators, middlemen, uh, which in some ways also uh, exploited the Aboriginal artists. Uh, in a related way, Rang Rupar at uh, Documenta seeks to challenge the existing power structures of the established art system right? by decentralizing curatorial agency and control. So it's very easy to see why Embassy has a central place at Documenta, both curatorially as well as physically sitting on the Friedrich Platz. Um, can I ask you to share your thoughts about uh, Documenta itself, the exhibition? Oh, I just thought they liked me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, look, um, I, I was um, so surprised, so um, gracious you know, to, to see where they position you know, my, my work. You know, like, um, um, it's, it's obvious that they see it as very important. You know, like, um, and in... Um, the coming years, you know, like indigenous art from around the world is going to become you know, uh, very important. And um, it's, we've had some movements, you know, we've had African art. Um, uh, at the moment we have Islamic art and we'll be moving into this, this uh, period where, you know, indigenous art is going to be the, the thing, you know, like, um, and of course, you know, the money end of, of town is going to be showing, you know, the, the inoffensive, polite works, you know, like, and that will be, that, and you, you already see this, you know, like, uh, with um, the, the show in Paris and um, the, the two Gagosian shows, you know, where, where you see Steve Martin's, um, you know, um, collection, you know, like, um, of family cover, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's that's where the money will go. It'll go into, into, into that sort of thing. I think this what the um, significance of this documentary show is that that um, we we don't need the the money into town. You know, like, um, we, we we can put on shows. You know, like, um, um, and we're still our shows will be that will be that good. You know, uh, as the show there is, is showing. That we'll be able to get to show in in all the the big galleries anyway, the big galleries, the big museums, and that without having to play into um, the market. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it's a bit like sport. You know, like um, you know, England invented soccer. You know, nobody thinks that you know the the English are the best soccer players. You know? <laughs> So, you know, like, um, there's Western art, you know, like, uh, nobody, nobody thinks that 10% of the world's population is making, you know, 90% of the world's, you know, best art. <laughs> and I hear the response, uh, in spite of all the controversies uh, that we hear about, that read about Documenta, the response from the German public and was, was the international public as well has been overwhelming. It, it truly has. Um, I think um, all this publicity, you know, like, um, I, it's taken a, a huge toll on my friends, you know, like uh, in uh, Run Group, in the artistic team. Um, but I have this tendency to look for you know, the, the positives out of this thing, you know, like, and you know, with all this publicity, you know, like, uh, we're going to be the most talked about documenter ever. <laughs> <laughs> and. And consequently, you know, like um, um, the attendances, you know, uh, 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 
really, really strong. You know, like, um, um, in fact, it, it's. Um, I believe that they're going to exceed. You know, um, my friend's documentary. You know, like, um, you know, Karen, she's very proud that she uh, holds the record for the highest <laughs> attending <laughs> documenter. So, uh, but this one. Uh, the numbers are already ahead of um, of Carolyn's, you know, so. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, like the people are voting with their feet. They come, you know, they're hearing about this anti-Semitism. They're coming to look for it. They're not finding it and they're enjoying the show and they're going home and they're telling people, I'm like, um, go and have a look at this show, you know. Oh, that's, that's encouraging to hear. Oh, yeah. like the, the lineup was out past my, uh, my embassy there um, uh, last Saturday. You know, so, um, the crowds are getting bigger, you know, like um, ev every week. So um, the, the people are not buying it. You know, like um, I'm, I'm, I'm very upset for for my fellow artists, you know, like um, my friends in Tarang Party, you know, who've been accused of being anti-Semitic. You know, like um, their work is not anti-Semitic. Their work uh, is anti-discriminatory, uh, you know, across all discrimination. You know, so. And they were very upset um, uh, uh, with that as, as well. You know, so I um, share that sadness uh, with them. But you know, the media has tarred us all with that same brush. You know. They've called this whole show anti-Semitic. Now, I'm from a legal background, so you know, look, I'm I'm examining you know um, my. Uh, my options, you know, like uh, because I, I believe that that being called uh, anti-Semitic you know, actually um, is going to um, affect my my career moving forward. So I'm going I'm going to seek some some advice on, on um, some remedies. Yeah. Let's say. Okay, at this point, I'd like to open up the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, if you put your hand up, I think there are some microphones going around. Hi, thank you uh, for, for this talk. Um, wel welcome to Singapore. Um, hi, Eugene. So um, I'm going to try and ask this question again, because when I tried asking this of some Australian artists in Dhaka a long time ago, um, the, the reception wasn't very good. And my question is, is actually about advocacy. Obviously, what you're describing is going to be very complicated and a long time to resolve. So as an artist, do you see yourself either as an advocate or do you feel like it's necessary to work with other groups so that you almost hand over your work of art to a group that then takes it forward to champion other things. The, the group that got upset with me in Dhaka basically said that they were artists. And I, I couldn't get around my head. The work that they were doing sounded like they were advocating something. Right. And yet they just wanted to be artists. So it's really about the role of yeah. activism. I'll get to you. Yeah, and, and also your your approach, because you sound like you're more than an artist. Um, well, um, I describe myself as an, uh, an activist who masquerades as an artist. <laughs> um, look, in answer to your question, you know, it's a, it's a very good que uh, question too. Um, um, I, while I, while I point out things that are wrong, I also do. Um, Look at solutions, you know, like and and like you said, these things take a long time. So, um, and you know, like um, as Vincent Lingari said, you know, like um, we're Aboriginal, we know how to wait. Yeah, so, you know, like if something, if a pro program or project is going to take 20, 25, 30, 40, 50 years, then it takes that long. You know, but there's no point in trying to rush these things. You know, like. Um, yeah, everybody wants wants you know they want it all and they want it now. Yeah, well, sometimes I do too. But, but 
And these big things, you know, like um, I know that we have to have to um, reach and and look for solutions. You know, um, um, my next pro project um, is go is going to be I'm I'm um, going to write a draft constitution for a, a new entity, whether it be a nation state or so, whatever. But to write a constitution, um, a, a draft, and I want to take that draft around Australia. Look, uh, I want to go to the town halls. I want to do the old-fashioned town hall. I want to get to the people, like, um, and I, I want to build a team to be able to do that, and that be able to do that you know, long after I'm gone, because it, you know. The, the, the realization of something like like this um, would take you know, like forty to fifty years, I, I would imagine. So you know, like, um, uh, in in saying that, you know, like I'm I'm very optimistic that you know climate change is not going to kill us all before then. So yes, yeah, so I, I do have this long art is being an artist is you know like is, is a pre, is a privilege. Um, you know, that I've taken advantage of um, to, to basically try to advocate for you know, a, a better life, trying to lift the spirits of, of um, uh, my people and you know, like and other people you know, um, who are, are oppressed. I think we have a question from Adele. Hi, Richard. Uh, simple question. I just was really curious about how you felt about the Aboriginal embassy being located in a historically resonant space like the city hall chamber. In some ways, to me, I see this work as a signal that it's unceded territory for art and you're claiming it back in some ways for, I guess, the art gallery versus the historic monument that it is. And in a way, speaking as an artist, and saying to the state, no concessions given, or kind of, in your words, zero fucks given. Yeah, oh, look, I'm, I'm, like the fact that this is inside this colonial building, you're like, oh, damn, could you imagine this happening, you know, like in the 19th century? Yeah, you know, like um, even you know, the early 20th century, you know, so, um, I'm, I prefer it to be outside, <laughs> you know, opposite, opposing, you know, like uh, uh, the way that the, the embassy is situated in uh, Castle at the moment. It's facing the Friedrichsianum. Um, I was at the um, Hawaii uh, Triennale earlier this year. Um, the embassy was, uh, we had the back facing to the the Supreme Court building and facing towards the Iolani Palace, which is um, uh, Hawaiian sovereign land. Mm -hmm. But to get permission to put the embassy in, you know, on the grounds there, had to go through three different American government departments. Mm -hmm. So I get where you're coming at there. But I think it's, it sort of um, supersedes all these um, uh, colonial barriers that, um, like this colonial building, it's inside this the, the sacred heart of, of the building. Like here we are, you know, um, talking about. Um, well, we could talk about some um, revolutionary stuff. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other questions for for Richard at this point? No, not yet. Well, I'd like to follow on uh, from the earlier question. So we see in a lot of uh, art now, and we see it especially in the works in documenta, where art takes on a more political, even activist dimension. Do you think all art today necessarily has to be political in some way? Well, what do I know about art? <laughs> I just make it. You know. <laughs> I don't display it or anything like that. Um, 
Um, well, certainly it's, it's the art that interests me. Like, um, um, like, yeah, some art is you know, like um, it's just beautiful. You know, like, um, but you know, like I can sit in a train and, and watch beauty just rush by me at two hundred and forty kilometres an hour. You know, um, um, I, I'm not that interested in that. I'm, I'm, whereas if there's something that's going to challenge my thinking, um, yeah, I'm going to go and see it. But that's just me. You know, like, um, and everybody's everybody's different. You know, like, um, um, and political art is, is not that po not that popular. You know, like, um, you know, well, in the market, certainly. No, no, it's, it's, but it's definitely the kind of art you're seeing more in museums, uh, binales, for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, the, well um, there's biennale art, you know, like. Um, um, Curator art. Um, <laughs> um, so well, that's what finds its way into Biennale. So, so, so I mean, so. Um, right. Yes, Phoebe. Hi, Richard. Um, we've been seeing on the screen flashing up one of your works, and it's a uh, it's called Pay the Rent. Yeah. So the, the digital sign that's um, on the facade of the building with the, the numbers. I was wondering if you could share some more about that work and if this yeah. is a kind of new direction for you. Yeah, um, okay, well, the, the number, you know, the sign is, it's called pay the rent. And it, you know, it represents, you know, like um, a, a massive number that number you know, represents the amount of money that the Australian government owes to the Aboriginal people for the use of our land. You know, like, um, you know, I'm not talking about selling it to them. You know, I'm not selling out my people. I'm just saying for the use of our land. That's what I, you know, like, and I've calculated um, that on a whole number of different issues. You can you can do it on parking in a city, parking in a, in a, in a country town, or you can do it on residential rate. Um, rates, re residential leases, uh, commercial leases, all, all these sorts of things. You know, uh, and you'll end up with, with figures, you know, like um, much bigger than that. And I started that, that figure on 101 because I, you know, it was basically colonisation 101. Don't do it because you can't afford it. Um, and, and also, it's it's a work in response to this this statement from from the heart, you know, like um, you know uh, the emptiness of the statement from from the heart, you know, like um, uh, this this work um, uh, challenges that that it it, it brings you know, money to the table, you know, like it, it also uh, brings power sharing to the table, and and also land, you know, like, you know None of those, neither of those things, land or money, is enough. We have to have power sharing. We have to have designated seats in Parliament, not voices to Parliament. We need designated seats in each state. We need designated seats in each Parliament, in, in both federal and state, and even down to the local level. We need to have designated um, parts there. Like this is... There's no way that, that we should accept anything less than, a, than any deal um, that, that it has to have power sharing with those other two elements, with land, with money. Do you see that happening uh, during your lifetime? Of course not. <laughs> Jeez. You know, like, um, man, I'm... I'm Partied hard all my life. I'm, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not going to live that long. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you're wrong about that. But <laughs> oh, I, I am. I am not wrong about it. Let me tell you. Do you have any other questions for for Richard? Oh, we have one. Hello. Thank you for sharing. Uh, going back on this uh, idea of land and uh, fighting for land and reclaiming land, I was wondering if all these years of um, 
uh, social fights and civil fights, uh, you, uh, you foresee any other way to establish a relationship with the land that is not based on ownership? Um, and ideas, ideas of reclamations that do not um, uh, perpetuate uh, certain ideas of ownership in relation to the land that maybe come from different frameworks of uh, legal frameworks, but also epistemological frameworks. So if there's a, some kind of wisdom or different kind of relation to the land that can go beyond an idea of ownership. Um, well, if I go out to my, any of my country, and if I just, um, Stayed there, you know, like, um, and I was just fishing out of the river. Um, if I was there more than three days, some white guy would come up to me and ask me what, what I was doing there. Guaranteed. You know, like, um, so, ownership, you know, like, um, there, there is, this is, it's not a fantasy, okay? You know, like, this, you know, this is something that is, is enforced. Upon us, you know, like, so, you know, like um, we have to. Um, we live in a modern world. We have to. We we have to adapt something where 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 we probably didn't consider the land as ours. We considered uh, ourselves as part of of that. But now, with the with this crazy way of thinking you know, um, that that dominates the world, you know, and, and basically, you know. Like, um, the land that that we owned, or that we were part of, has been exploited. The the, the resources have been re just taken without our permission, you know, without ceding anything to us. So, for for us, ownership is you know is a really complex issue, and dealing with it, you know, like. Um, in the most childish ways, you know, like we have to go to a, an institution that's established by the people who stole what we had. And we have to operate within the rules that those people who stole our land attach to that. Now it's very hard to have, a, have a, an adult conversation when we are the only adults in the room, because this juvenile idea, you know, like of colonialism, of, of conquest and and owning other people's lands and that sort of thing, is absolutely nonsensical. And yet we have to na we have to navigate our way through this thing. You know, we we have have to go. Basically, cap in hand, you know, saying, "Oh, please, Mister, you know, can you, can you, um, can we put this case? You know, this guy lives on this island. You know, like um, we think that you know, this you know, shows that we had prior ownership of this place. You know, it's 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 we need a revolution in 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 the way that things are looked at." You know, ownership of land. Come on, how, how can you actually own it? You know, like, I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, for, for me, I, that's my question. How do you own it? Yep. See. Yeah. Hi, Richard. Um, I have a follow-up question to your partying heart lifestyle. So what, what happens to embassy um, after, you know, after you're gone from this earth? Um, what does it mean for that artwork? You know, because it's got such a symbolic uh, meaning and it's got that rich history. But what happens to Richard Bell's embassy? Well, it's been collected by the Tate. Um, right. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, we're, we're in the process of of, um, um, of telling them how they how they're supposed to do it. Like, um, or 
like I did this thing as a tribute and an homage to the young people who in Australia around around that time or in the in the, the couple of years pre preceding that they started setting up um, Aboriginal tent embassies you know in the country towns as well as the cities you know so it, it was a, it was a phenomenon, you know, like, and, and it preceded you know, um, um, uh, a lot of the the, the idol no more. You know, and that sort of thing. Like these people were out there, and like at the moment, I think there'd be you know like a half a dozen tent embassies scattered around Australia. So it's, you know, the tent embassy is not going to go anywhere. You know, like um, it, the, it's still there in Canberra. My, my edition of it, it you know, will be, um, it'll be able to be activated upon, you know, um, some certain rules, you know, like, um, you know, um, it, it must be a space, you know, where um, the um, oppressed can, can have a voice. So that's probably the, the most important um, uh, thing there, and, and it, uh, the discussions must be about um, the oppression of of people, um, and looking, and also the positivity. We need to be looking for for solutions you know, to to these problems. Well, it is a space, as you've said, that uh, imagine for the articulation of better futures. Right. So, I have yeah. two questions for you. Firstly. What what is your vision for a better future, and what do you think? How do you think art has a role to play in that? Jesus Christ! You look, um, <laughs> you're like um, he's that. I, I, I need to invoice you. <laughs> Come on, um, um, oh, um look, I'm. Well, as, as Isaac said it, you know, uh, and said one thing. He said that was, was really important in this. It says, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to end, you know, imagine the end of capitalism. Yep. Capitalism is the culprit, right? You have a look at the, you know, all the problems around the world, it's capitalism. Now, I'm fighting against capitalism. You know, like I'm an anti-capitalist, okay. Put a target on me or whatever, but... Um, we need to, to wind back from, from capitalism. You know, like, uh, I'm not saying wind back from trade or anything like that. Trade and commerce was going on long before capitalism was invented. You know? it's, it's you know, like a late European thing, you know, like uh, maybe 250 years ago or something. So, you know, and it's only taken that long for, the, for that crazy ideology to bring the whole planet to its knees. Come on, we've got to do something. So that's the first thing, you know, like, um, um, and out of out of that to to try to wind us our, our, our way back out of out of this, you know, like um, maybe we need another pandemic to slow down <laughs> the development again. Yes. Well, there was a lot of hope during the well, the current pandemic that um, societies would start reassessing the way we used to live and the capitalist systems of our world, but. Unfortunately, a lot of them seems to have uh, been forgotten now. Yes. Oh, yeah, as soon as the pandemic's over, you know, like, uh, <laughs> out the window. But, yeah, well, look, up. I, I, I always try to find something, um, something positive um, out of it, you know, like, um, you know, even if it's just a party. You know, so. <laughs> and the, the role that you think art can play in... Oh, the role... I think I think um, art plays a, a really significant role. You know, like um, I think um, uh, this documenter you know, um, is, show, is showing that. Like there's uh, um, like singing, dancing. You know, like um, that's how you get the messages across. You know, like there's um, a lot of um, you know, like Safta Ahmed, you know, um, the Australian artist, you know, uh, does these fabulous drawings. You know, like um, you know, anima animation, you know, really helps to tell difficult stories and this sort of thing. You know, um, s like singing makes it easier. D 
dancing, interpretive dance, all, all these sorts of things. The arts have a really important ro role to play, you know. You know, not only calling out you know, like, uh, the power, but also, also you know, presenting you know, the, the positivity there, you know, uh, presenting the ideas you know, that can make us better. You know, like, there's a lot of talk about love at the moment, you know, like, and, and that's really important. You know, like, uh, we need to, to love more. You know, we need to, to cut back on the hate you know, like, um, and amplify the love you know, for, for, for each other, for ourselves you know, um, and for you know, our friends, even our enemies. You know, just back the fuck off from this hate business. You know. Well, final questions. Uh, you have two more questions yeah. here at the front. Hi, sorry about that. Uh, you mentioned that for posterity, uh, there are going to be some rules with this work about how it can be shown. And one of them, the example you gave, was to give voice to the oppressed. I'm very curious to know what rules you gave Eugene <laughs> in terms of bringing the embassy here in Singapore. I'm sitting across from you. I know, <laughs> but I would really like to know what one of the rules at least was. <laughs> I don't well, think there were any rules. Well, I'll, I'll let him off the hook here. Usually it's me asking questions. You know, so you're like, uh, yeah, this is my tent, this is my fucking tent, okay? This is my, <laughs> this is my artwork. You know, like, uh, I should be asking you the question, okay? So, uh, see how generous I am? <laughs> thank you, thank you, Richard. I think we have one more question at the, at the back. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Bell, for the sharing. Can you speak a bit louder? Oh, thank you, Mr. Bell. Thank you, Mr. Bell, for the sharing. Um, I'm not sure whether you intended it or not, but I, I think the embassy work especially is a very good and effective situationist work. Uh, that's one. And the second thing is, or oh, the question is, I, I found out that the signboards are usually uh, painted by hand in, in the location by locals wherever it travels. So I wanted to share a little bit about the thinking and the process behind that, any interesting anecdotes of those yeah oh well one of the reasons I, I i like to do that is because um in in this art world um artists get five percent of the budget okay so i try to put uh, money into artists pockets uh, as much as i can i employ artists you know, so um, um like to I could get these printed, you know, like, um, but, but I don't want to do that. I, want, I, I actually want an artist to get paid, you know, to, to, to be doing that, you know, to be, to be making it or whatever, you know, like, um, um, and that there should be a budget, a, a good budget, you know, for, for that to happen. I think that's, uh, I think that's in keeping with, you know, just the solidarity, you know, like a, a, a citizen of this earth, you know, like, you know to, to be looking after our fellow beings. Okay, well, thank you very much, Richard. I think that's all we have time for today. So please join me in thanking Richard again for this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.